few more lessons in this series, The Perseverance of the Saints. And um, I think it's a good time just to go ahead and turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. So why are we going back there? <laughs> because it's in the Bible. <laughs> Ezekiel, chapter 33. Good to see all of y'all out and people mending up in their health issues. We all have them at times. We'll keep on keeping on. This is basics number 482, lesson six of this series, The Perseverance of the Saints. And I entitled this lesson, Interpretations Without Context. Succinctly saying, Exactly what I'm going to try to say tonight. There are select Bible passages interpreted with Arminian theology overtones that can lead a believer to doubt their salvation. So we're going to look at a few of those tonight. Sounds like fun. It's just something that I think it's important to do because when we study this subject... I get asked these questions. I have been a long time, even a long time before I was a pastor, and I imagine some of you do as well about, you know, uh, once saved, always saved, eternal security, perseverance of the saints, uh, some of those uh, synonymous statements that are used in Christianity regarding uh, what's going to happen to me now that I've, we've, I've accepted Christ as my Savior. Well, what's the Bible say to that teaching into that question, and then what does the Bible say about other things that people pull in to that answer? And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And Ezekiel chapter 33 is a little part of that. This was written in the 6th century B.C. And a little history of Ezekiel. He was a priest. His name means God will strengthen and uh, he was among the Jewish exiles carried into Babylon. Now, a lot of folks don't know that. And it was between the first and final deportation into Judah, uh, out of Judah. Uh, his book shows him as a man of stern integrity, as you know, strong purpose, completely devoted to the practices of his priestly religion. But like Daniel and the Apostle John, he prophesied outside the land of Judah, and his prophecy, like theirs, follows the method of symbol and vision. As we know, we're not going to do a breakdown of Ezekiel. I'd love to, like I did Daniel. Maybe one day we'll get to it. But unlike the pre-exilic prophets whose ministry was primarily to Judah, he spoke to both tribes. He spoke to the ten tribes in the northern kingdom as well. Uh, many of them had been carried off, and he was still speaking to them as he was taken years later uh, into Babylon. And uh, it's important to understand that he had a responsibility, he sensed, to let the people know that they were in bondage because they had it coming. Because one of the things that they ask is why. If you look at verse chapter 33... Verse 17, it says, Yet the children of thy people say, The way of the Lord is not equal. And the Lord says, But as for them, their way is not equal, not fair. In other words, the children of Israel, and Judah in particular, when they were carried into Babylon, said, It is not fair what has happened to us. God has turned his back on us. And so often that's what happens. God gets the blame for the mess we've gotten ourselves into. Verse 20, they said, Yet uh, when the righteous turneth from his righteousness, verse 18, it is said, and commits iniquity, he shall even die for it. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, you shall live by it, Ezekiel says. And yet you, Judah and Israel, though taken earlier, Judah at this time in particular, yet you say the way of the Lord is not equal, it's not fair, that God is unfair. God was accused of being unjust because of the wickedness of the people and because of the bondage that they were told that they would go into 
and they refused to accept that message from their messenger that God had sent to them. So, you're just not fair, God. Well, a context in verses 7 and 8 comes out of that mindset in Ezekiel. So, this is lesson 6. Wrong interpretations can lead to a lifelong quest to earn God's favor. And that's what I want us to understand in these lessons, that there are people who say that they are born again, and they're constantly trying to impress God and other Christians, and maybe the world too, with their own brand of holiness uh, to the degree that the immature or uninformed believer uh, starts following their lead because they have that same sense that they can never please God. And when you get the wrong interpretation from the Scripture, it can lead to a lifelong quest to earn God's favor. You can't earn His favor. You just can't earn it. That's why it's called grace. It's unmerited. You can't work for it. You don't have to. God doesn't expect us to. So we'll look at some passages tonight, verses 7 and 8. The first one we'll look at. So thou, O son of man, this is the Lord speaking to his prophet Ezekiel, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. This is from God through his prophet to tell his people, saying, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Heavenly Father, we ask as we go into passages such as this and how they are sometimes interpreted, help us to get the right interpretation and context of it that you intended for it to to, to be. Thank you for your looking out for us, for your care, for healing us, for strengthening us and for encouraging us in a plane that's at a level that's different than the way the world thinks. Help us to see things from your point of view, from your perspective. Help us to respect you and appreciate what you offer to us. And then fill us with the presence of your Spirit in such a way is that uh, we are not only you know, disciples uh, for our Savior and believers, but we are also uh, informed and ready to give a witness uh, in various ways, uh, to the not only to the unsaved, but also for maybe some who are who are sidelined in their Christian growth because of the sense that they can't do good enough and they're throwing their hands up. Help us to be a, an encourager to such believers. Thank you for this time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First of all, Ezekiel, as we saw there, was a watchman, verse 7 of chapter 33. He was a watchman for the whole house of Israel, living in exile in Babylon with those captured in 586 B.C. God had him there. God uses his servants, you and I. God uses us where he has us and when he has us where he has us uh, to be his light bearer. So never underestimate your place in this society, in this world, in your family, because you are a light bearer to those who perhaps are still in darkness or are misinformed. God had Ezekiel there to remind his own people that they were overtaken by wicked kingdoms because God had sicked them on them because they had sinned against God so egregiously that God could not look the other way any longer. Even in captivity, they charged God with being unfair, as we saw in verses 17 and 20. They thought that God was unfair for their suffering, though they had been forewarned by his prophets for Hundreds of years. Ezekiel was called to them as a prophet and as a comforter who could bring the word of the Lord to them if they would repent of their sins and then start understanding 
why they were in the condition that they were in. Because until a believer who maybe has stepped out of step with the things of God acknowledges that they are wrong, they're not going to recover. They're not going to change. That's sad, but it's true. Ezekiel had looked out for their welfare. God had looked out for their welfare. And he was told by the Lord that if he had not warned Israel of the impending judgment, which he had done, but had he not warned Israel of the impending judgment because of their iniquity, that their fall would fall partly as a responsibility to him that he would be guilty of neglect as a prophet of God. And then God says, but his blood will I require at thine hand. There have been those who have said that if you are not at every door, then their blood is on your hands. That is a misapplication of scripture. This is a time of, this was a wartime prophet. Speaking to an exiled people who were the people of God. Now, yes, being called the people of God did not mean they were all believers. Many were not. But they were under his divine uh, call to be his people. Obviously, some were. Ezekiel being one of those. Daniel, his friends and others. Jeremiah. Other prophets as well. But he was told that had he not shared the truth with the people, his blood would I require at thine hand. As a pastor, I am a public spokesman for the word of the Lord. You too have a responsibility as a witness for Christ. I'm not trying to minimize that at all. And we have a responsibility to speak to wickedness when it is in our midst, in our face. And to speak of God's redemption when it is called upon. But this call out was to God's people, not witnessing to the unsaved. We have a responsibility to police our own family in a godly manner and in a loving manner. But we are not called to police the unsaved. Yes, we are citizens of a country and we vote at the booth and we have a right to stand up for what we believe. But God does not call you. The Holy Spirit and the word of God calls the sinner to repentance. We are called to be uh, looking out for one another. They were called in Israel to look out for one another. And if they did not look out for one another, especially if they were a called prophet, as was Ezekiel, then it's incumbent upon God to judge that prophet. There is there is a lot ways on a calling and a responsibility to be a public spokesman for God to a group, or in his case, it was done at a national level. That's a lot. He was remember he was a former he was still a priest. So I'm not, but I'm a pastor, and I am a public spokesman for the word of the Lord, and I have a responsibility to call out wickedness at all levels and to warn especially believers of the consequences of ignoring God's word. And some take the passage in Ezekiel 33, verses 7 through 8, their blood being on your hands, to mean if that if we, we as believers do not warn everyone of God's call to repentance to get saved, then we will in the end at the judgment seat have their blood on our hand, that their souls will be on our hands, that we will be found guilty as negligent. And while it is true all believers bear responsibility as witnesses for Jesus Christ and witnesses for the gospel, it is also true we are not Old Testament prophets in exile in a foreign land explaining ourselves, looking back on doing the will of God as Ezekiel had faithfully done. He had done, and God has said, you did the right thing, but had you not done that, then you would have been culpable in them perhaps going into exile because you hadn't told him and forewarned them that this was coming and you did your job. Not only are we not Old Testament prophets living in exile, but we are living 
in the age of grace. We're not living in the age of the law of Moses as was Ezekiel. Ezekiel uh, was not threatened with loss of salvation. And some who believe that you can lose your salvation if you don't witness to enough people. And that as they're being judged at the end of time at the great white throne, God will be pointing out you and your failure to be a witness to them. And I have, some of you have maybe been in a church like this before, but I've heard this kind of preaching before. Not here, but I've heard it before. And it's just a scare tack to get people to do, to get the numbers up in churches. And you get a bunch of scared people witnessing for Christ, fearing they're going to lose their salvation if they're not good door knockers. You see a lot of them out on Saturday mornings, I'll say that. That's under a different perspective. But Ezekiel was not told he was going to lose his salvation anywhere in this passage. And Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26 that he was free from the blood of all men because he did keep a pure testimony concerning who Christ is. That's what he says here in the age of grace, that we keep Christ pure and who he is in our witness, that we don't muddy up the gospel waters. And we know that Paul did not witness to everyone that uh, he came through their regions. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7 says, Now when they, this is, uh, the Spirit is guiding Paul to go to Troas here. This is called what we call the Macedonian vision in Luke, uh, Acts 16, written, written by Luke. Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Forbidden? What? Forbidden by the Spirit of God to not preach the word in Asia? After that they came to Messiah. They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit prevented them not there to go. And so they passed through Mycenae and came down to Troas. So God had a place for them to go. And one of those places he was told not to go through was Galatia the first time in his first missionary journey. What? Yeah, that is to set up there and stay at least at, at that period of time. He did go back, of course. So even God at times has directed his servants to keep away from entire populations. The omniscience of God knows the heart of the people. And sometimes it's required of God to give people time to pause how they are living. And if they refuse to change through how they are living, they will go on to further and further lower and lower degradations of society. That's how some societies become so degraded or degraded in their morals, in their hostility, in their uh, sorrow and suffering, is God has given them an opportunity to repent, and His Spirit still speaks to their hearts, but they are far from Him. A very few will turn, not enough for God to turn the nexus or the axis of their nations from that of an unbelieving, wicked nation to that of a flourishing, righteous, prosperous nation. And it stays that way. And Psalm 107 is a perfect example of how that happens. Now, I'll say this. It takes a long time for a nation to get uh, the status of what we call a client nation under God or a nation under God or a privileged nation. But it doesn't take long to lose it. And that's probably what's happened to America. It doesn't take long to lose it. But anyway, you think about how long we were here in America before we fought for our independence and had the Declaration of Independence signed in 1776. We fought years after that because it's on like Donkey Kong then. When we declared our independence, we weren't independent. We were then had to fight for it. You declare your independence. You got to fight for it. And when you get saved, you don't have to fight to keep your salvation, but you do have to fight to keep your testimony. You do have to do that. I have to do that. And it's a battle that happens on the outside trying to pull you back and a battle that happens on the inside. You know that and I know that. So we have to be careful. But God doesn't did not tell Ezekiel that, hey, I'm going to take your salvation away from you if you hadn't witnessed to these people 
and told them what they needed to do. The Bible never says it, but this passage is often used in that regard. I'll give you another one. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, if you would please. Verse 23. This is the second one. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Verse 21 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. And we have begun to reckon one was brought unto him who owed him ten thousand talents. That's a lot of money. For as much as he had nothing with which to pay the king, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. That was a big forgive. It's a picture of us being forgiven of all of our trespasses against God, as we know. But the same servant went out. He was an impish, petty kind of man. He went out and found one of his fellow, his fellow servants, you know, it's the pyramid scheme, you know. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Or a hundred pence as you have there. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Saying, pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet just like he, the, this other guy had. And he besought him saying, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And he wouldn't. He didn't have patience with him, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you besought me. You know, you pleaded with me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was angry, wroth with him, and delivered him to the inquisitors, tormentors, in other words, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your heart forgive not everyone his brother his trespasses." Some people use this passage to say that if you don't have a forgiving heart, God will judge you. God will hold you in contempt. And God will make you be punished for it. Now, there's one thing about God disciplining his child, but this here takes it to a whole new level. Here we have a passage concerning how proportionate our forgiveness should be toward others. Rabbinic teaching held that one should forgive another up to three times. But Jesus Christ taught that there is no limit. He said 70 times seven. For we have been forgiven for every offense we have committed against God. And so just think about that. We have been forgiven for every offense that we have committed against God. That sins of commission... And sins of omission, things that you didn't do that you should have done, things that you did do that you shouldn't have done. Both cognizant and ignorant, all of those were forgiven when you came to Christ. So if all of your sins, both those things that God told you to do that you didn't do, and those things that God told you not to do that you did do, whether you did them ignorantly or you were aware you did them intentionally, all those sins were forgiven when you came to Christ because he covered all the bases. Nothing was left out. Because if anything was left out, then God could not have imputed his righteousness to your soul because it wouldn't have been pure enough for that righteousness to have been imputed to you. 
God wouldn't have sealed you if you were rotten on the inside. It would not have worked. God had to have you as a pure vessel when he saved you. And when he saved you, he did it because all your offenses were taken away from you judicially. Judicially, they were all taken away. And that's what positional truth reveals. That when we repent of our sins, we come to Christ for salvation, then our sins that we have committed and will commit, whether ignorantly or aware, and then our sins of omission, the things that we fail to do that God calls us to do, all those sins are forgiven and allowing you to be placed into the body of Christ and you are sealed into the day of redemption because those things are taken from you as an offense to God. This is what positional truth reveals. That when we repent of our sins and believe and receive Christ as our Savior and Lord, all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. Only by all of our sins being forgiven can we be made acceptable to God to start with. That's the word Agapetos, or in the beloved. You cannot get into the family of God unless you're 100% pure. You and I can't do that on our own, but when we repent, we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, believing that He is the Son of God who was raised the third day according to the Scriptures, and we tell God that, whether you have got this great emotional story to go with it, or you're a very low-key type of person that you've believed the exact same doctrine, the same teaching, you're equally saved, and everything that you have has been equally pardoned so that you can be part of the royal family of God. It is not because of anything that you do that you inherit eternal life, nor is there anything that you do that allows you to keep eternal life. And we're going to talk about that Sunday, about eternal life, because that is an attribute of God, and you don't get that until you receive Jesus Christ as Savior. That's significant for us to understand that. Because eternal means eternal. It doesn't mean until you mess up. (laughs) And it's by the grace of God that we have that as a part of the divine package that we receive at salvation. But there will be some who will say from various scriptures that if you don't forgive people as God, your Father has forgiven you, then God will be angry with you and God will remove you from that place of favor and put you in a place of judgment as this servant was. That's not the context here. He's trying to tell us that we should be forgiving as others are, as God has been forgiving of us. But he's not threatening with loss of salvation. We could nor would not have been made righteous in the righteousness of God as 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us. But he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We no, could not, nor would have not, would have been made, declared righteous. And the righteousness of God is some of our transgressions had been left out of his forgiveness. Because if that would be the case, then when we sin the next time, our his righteousness would have had to been removed from us because we were unclean. But that's not what God does. There are people who try to get saved over and over again, and they've only got like three or four bad things that they can do. They're not offended by their mental attitude sins. They're not offended by the sins of the tongue. They're only offended by a few biggies. And we don't have to say what they are. We all know. (laughs) We've been in the Baptist church too long not to know that. But those of the Arminian theological perspective have taken the illustration Christ gave in Matthew 18, 23 through 35 of the unforgiving servant and have used that illustration to claim that if we as God's servants, his children are unforgiving as Christians as that servant was who had been forgiven all his debt, which was much, but then would not forgive the small debt that was owed to him and had that man thrown in jail, they claim that God would likewise take our forgiven debt back from us and put it back on us, as did that king to that ungrateful servant. And this is another misapplication of Scripture. 
The Bible says that God has cast our sins as f- down into the depths of the sea, not to be brought back up again. He's cast them behind his back, and he has forgotten him, them, he says. He has cast them as far as the east is to the west. They'll never meet again. If we sin after salvation, and I will say this, we will. God will discipline us, but he will not disown us. God will discipline us as per Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 12, 6 through 11, I think there. God will deal with us with divine discipline as his own children, and he will do it in proportion to the seriousness of what we're getting into. He will deal with it in our lives, but not so much as to disown us and send his own weak children to eternal hell. Now, I could not send my own child to hell. I don't care how bad they are, I could not do that. I hope they would not want me sent there either. I may, uh, and I had them, I would discipline them when they were young, but I would never disown them. I love my children, I still do. I'd never disown them. And God will not disown us. We are already creating enough misery for ourselves to have eternal uh, punishment added on to that. What kind of a twisted, self-righteous mind thinks that way? That God will disown us if we give in to our natural earthly weakness. It's not a license to sin. It's a warning to watch ourselves for sure. It's not a license to sin, but it also is not right to make God a cosmic an antagonist or a cosmic ogre in the process. And that's what these folks do. Perhaps someone who could never please their own father thinks that the same God is the same kind of... I wonder what uh, uh, Jacobus Arminius' father was like or his father examples were like. I started to read up on that and I said, no, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Not No psycho babble here. Perhaps someone who could never please their own father thinks that God is the same kind of God, and he is not, if that would be the case, that he would disown his own child. So there's one. All right, you and Matthew, let's go to chapter 24, one of the most famous passages that people use, Matthew 24. I've had this one thrown at me in the years past as a young Christian back in the day. Maybe you have heard this done as well. I will remind all of us that Matthew 24 and 25 are tribulation material. I always keep that in mind when you study Matthew 24 and 25, that when you hear it being applied to the church, just take it with a grain of salt. There may be, and obviously sometimes some secondary application to this, but you're not even on the earth during Matthew 24 and 25. You're not even on the planet. The rapture has already taken place prior to this. But let's look at this. Jesus answered and said to them, verse 24, he's talking about the end of the age in verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Remember, the church age had not begun yet. They were still in the era of the law. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? He's talking about the second coming, not the rapture. And of the end of the era, or the world, or the age. Talking about the end of that age before the millennium. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will, and shall deceive many. Yes. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. No, because there's a thousand years to follow the tribulation period. For nation shall rise against nation. Now, yes, we do still have that. Don't get me wrong. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and divers places. And the kind that Jesus is talking about is tribulation, woes, bowl wraths. It's not talking about the things that happen as a part of the earth giving itself up through the second law of thermodynamics as seen in uh, chapter 8 because those things do happen. And though these things are part 
of this old earth because it's not meant to be. This earth is not eternal. Uh, God had to make it, so it's not eternal. Life does not come from the earth. Life comes from God, and the earth just helps support that. But all these are the beginning of sorrows. That's the second half of the tribulation period. Then shall they deliver you. This is in the second half when after the covenant is broken between Antichrist and uh, the and the, and um, the leaders of that day, Israel being one. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. That's Revelation 12, verses 13 through 17. Revelation 13 and verse 7. And they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's chapter 25 and verse 35 of Matthew. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. They're going to turn on one another. People are even more so than they do today. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many because iniquity shall abound. Remember, the Holy Spirit won't be here during that time. The love of many shall wax or grow cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. It's not the same type of gospel that we're talking about. Matthew twenty four thirteen, I suppose, is used to declare that the believer can never be sure of his salvation, that you must endure to the end to be saved. However, the text has reference to the believer, the one who got saved, who had never rejected the gospel, who got the gospel in the tribulation period, has reference to the believer living during the future post-rapture tribulation period. And enduring to the end, they shall be saved. Well, if they're a believer, they're already saved. There's something about that word that people don't seem to understand. <laughs> doesn't say... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be put on probation. You shall be put to work to see if you can grind it out. That's not what the Scriptures teach. This passage has to do with the physical life of that individual. Not Because salvation refers to not only just soul, it also is used in context to national salvation. It also is used to sozo or sozo manoi in the word there for the Greek Rescued, saved, preserved, all means the same thing. It also means the preservation of the body or giving a new life. But the preservation of the body is the context here. You see, the you can, you can lose your salvation crowd idea is that the disciples were warned by Jesus that they might go into apostasy, verses 3 through 14. That this passage proves that you can lose your salvation if you do not endure faithfully until the end. However, the passage understood in its dispensational context, B, <laughs> is important for correct Bible interpretation. Because it sees the Jews who get saved in the tribulation period being deceived by false teachers. So Jesus forewarns them to beware of the deceit that is coming at that time. Deceit by false teachers is something, I will add, that all Christians can be deceived now. But Jesus taught that for those in the future tribulation period, if they should endure to the end, the same shall be saved. He is speaking of their physical preservation and them being able to physically enter into the millennial kingdom of Christ. He's not talking about soul salvation here. If you're saved, uh, you're saved. I don't understand why people can't get that. If I put money in the bank, I saved money in the bank, and I didn't spend it, and I go to the bank, and I ask them, I want to empty my savings account. I, if I have $100 or $1,000, and I know that's what's in there, that's what should be in there. And they're not going to say, well, uh, we didn't save it for you. Listen, that's not a savings account. God is not that kind of a God that he just tricks and deceives people. Our Lord is speaking of their physical preservation and them being people who would appreciate and enjoy the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant in that time. 
He is not speaking of their salvation preservation because only God can keep your salvation for you. And God keeps his word to himself. That is what you've got to rest upon, that his word is for himself. That preservation is for himself. First John chapter 5, verse 11 says, And this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, that is eternal life. And he that hath not the Son does not have eternal life. That's important for us to all always remember that. And when you believed in Christ, you received eternal life. And all these verses of Scripture that have their own contextual analysis, they need to be studied in their context. And he's referring to the physical preservation of those who are living during the tribulation period who got saved because many, the, the Lord will not, will, the Lord will spare them in his omniscience and his omnipresence. The Antichrist will not spare them. The um, allies to the Antichrist will not spare them. And people will tell on you if you're in the tribulation period. They will rat on you. Well, he doesn't get the mark. He's not following the plan. The build back better plan or whatever. Hmm. I call it the broke back better plan, uh, first plan. But anyway, he is not speaking of their salvation preservation. That's what God does. Now, the Stoic and ascetic, this is the ones that would tie walnut shells to their knees and crawl up to the church professing their allegiance to Christ so that it suffer more as they were showing their devotions to Christ. Now, there are groups that show devotions to Christ, and um, they will have all kinds of rituals in the world to show their devotion to their deities. There are the pictures that I've seen, maybe you've seen too, of people who are tying these long rods and ripping them and putting big fish hooks in their flesh. I know you don't want to hear about this after you've had supper. And then they'll have this long bar that goes through that, and they'll put buckets of nails and rocks in them and go down through the streets with their flesh being ripped off of them. But they're showing their devotion to their deity, and the more they suffer, supposedly the more holy they are. I'm going to tell you, I don't care how much you suffer, that does not make you holy. That literally blows a lot of people's minds when they think that well i'm i'm a very ascetic person i'm a i'm a minimalist uh, that makes me holy no it doesn't it just means you ain't got much stuff <laughs> and that's okay we're not to worship stuff some people have stuff and don't worship some people don't have nothing and worship the fact that they don't have stuff that's their business but the stoic and the ascetic are attracted to this interpretation of this just grinding it out the long-faced Christianity of not and taking great pride in self-control. But the Stoic and ascetic are attracted to the stringent lifestyle of self-control. But self-control does not pay for salvation. It does not pay to get it, neither does it pay to keep it. Not that we shouldn't have self-control, but I don't care if you do have self-control. If you are not living wrong, then it is only by the power of God that you're living right. All you're doing is throwing free will in there, and free will is non-meritorious. It's not a work. You say, well, do I get credit for free will? No, you don't. It's non-meritorious. <laughs> we like to take credit. What do I get if I don't follow uh, the right thing? I don't know. If you do it long enough, you end up in God's woodshed. Just doesn't seem fair. What? Go back to Ezekiel 33. It's not fair, God. I was good to you. I did what you told me to do. Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me. So, the Stoic, the ascetic, are attracted to an uh, interpretation of grinding it out. It helps them feel better about themselves, but it's not self-control that pays for salvation. It was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and God raising him from the dead in three days that justifies the sinner. Nothing more. Nothing more. Oh, one more. 
we got time. Galatians chapter 5, starting to get a little warm in here. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. I've only got a couple here. I'm on my, I don't have any more pages, so that's it. Galatians 5 and verse 4. <laughs> this is what some people liked about the questions in the bulletins. I know it's got to be getting to the end. We're not the last question. No, I know you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, if it were me sitting in the seat as it was years ago and we'd have the same thing, I'd say, well, he's getting there. He's getting there. <laughs> Galatians 5 and verse 4. Stand fast, therefore, verse 1, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. They were going back into a cosmic system of legalism and licentiousness for some. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Your works is not going to, pro- Christ will profit you nothing because you're dependent on yourself and Christ can't do you no good if you're dependent on yourself. I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Then you can't break no rules in. Christ has become then of no effect in you because you're trying to earn your salvation. Whoever you are, justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. You're falling from grace. The Apostle Paul warns the believers in Galatia to not return to the law for living out the Christian life. Because we go outside of God's plan of grace. He doesn't say you go outside of God's salvation. You don't go outside of God's... If you receive Christ as Savior, that's the point. Because you're saved by grace through faith and you're kept by grace. God's non-meritorious system. We cannot pay for God's favor through doing good deeds. If the believer resists and attempts to establish his Christian service to God by the works of the flesh, and maybe good works, this believer will be outside of the justice of God because he's depending on human good rather than divine good. He's not trusting in God for his salvation and his rewards. He's trusting in his own efforts. And that is the passage in Hebrews chapter tw- uh, 4 about coming to rest in Christ. Coming to rest, trust in Christ, not trust in a system. God does not bless a system. Falling from grace does not mean falling from salvation. That doesn't mean that God, that just means that God is withholding His grace or His unmerited favor from a hard-hearted, child of his this is not loss of salvation it is loss of that grace to help you endure the difficulties of life because if you and i turn our back on god then we have chosen to pay our own way and god can't give you comfort if you're fighting him you got to learn on your own sometimes and if you want to pay your own way god will let you but he will not let you go He will watch you and I wiggle if we decide we don't want to do his bidding. You're the one that's going to suffer. And that's totally unnecessary. Typically what so many do is that they oppose what is best for themselves. Trying to impress God. And God cannot be impressed. God cannot be impressed. Everybody stands back. Oh, we've done this. We've built this great cathedral. We've got this wonderful this. We've got this wonderful that and we've got even the greatest technology that you can imagine now so god you know get over there somewhere because this is the as this is our world now we are god doesn't have an age he's not getting back over there in the corner and and letting you have your fun and then thinking boy i wish i'd come up with that this is how ignorant some christians are that they come up with the new way to to do christianity to reinvent the wheel and you hear about all the kooky stuff that's going on in christianity today my goodness, now, some of these new theology books that I get, I didn't realize there was as much kookiness until I read Erickson's book on theology. There is more kook stuff when it comes to pr- trends towards what means salvation, which he's good at it and a lot of the stuff because he gets into what the social gospel is and Marxism and how that is, uh, how there's, of course, I used that some in the book that I wrote, how it's infiltrated the church. But it's also infiltrated politics and it's infiltrated politicians and it's infiltrated the writing of rules and laws and the mindset that is behind those who are believing they are working to earn their salvation. 
That's what they believe, that they're working to earn their salvation. That religion, if you want to call it that, is the center of all politics. And, of course, with that comes power when it's abused, of course. When I say religion, I don't mean it in a good sense. I mean it in a terrifying sense. But if we want to pay our own way and try to press God all of our lives, then God will let us do it, but it will not. It's 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, 13 through 15, hay, wood, and stubble. Okay, that doesn't help. Remember, God disciplines his child, but he does not disown his child. That's Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 11. He'll discipline us, but he won't disown us. First John 3, 8 through 9, there's an understanding there that if you're a child of God, you cannot sin. You know that passage pretty well. It's present tense. That's your whole answer right there. Don't need to add any more to it. First John chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, it says that he that commits sin is of the devil. Have you sinned in the last week? You done or said anything that you ought not said or done? I, I do not want confessions now. You're not going to get mine. <laughs> and you can't pay my wife enough to tell you. No, wait a minute. Maybe. Mm. Everybody's got a price. <laughs> but maybe I should take that back. Nix that on the uh, mic there. Okay. He that practices, the present active participle, the word commit, poyao, means to practice. He that practices sin is of the devil. In other words, you're not saved. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, which is what? Sin. Whosoever is born of God, perfect passive participle, perfect tense, completed action in past time, heaven, continuous results. Whosoever is born of God, who continues to continue to stay born of God, does not practice sin. Present active indicative, which means as a habit of life, you practice sin. You confess it. You, your Spirit of God gets after you. You confess it. For His, that is, God's seed remains in Him. The imputed righteousness of God remains in you. And God's Spirit is in you. And He's reminding you. And He's being grieved. And He's the Holy Spirit shares His grief with our human spirit, which shares that grief with our soul. And the misery index starts to rise. That's good. If the misery index did not rise as we as Christians sin, it says in Hebrews 12 that God has no part in you. Because he, he chastens every son that is his. So, the understanding of the present tense in verses 8 and 9 explains the very confusing passage there. That's practices as a habit of life. That's just that. And then the last one is Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 26 through 31. Of course, there's plenty of others, but these are the only ones because I'm going to get off of these and I'm not going to be on these anymore. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. The whole book itself is, is an enigma to many to interpret. I get that. It was to me as well. Hebrews 10, 26. You know, if you sin willfully, have you ever said, you know, I'm going to tell her off. I'm going to tell him off. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Remember the context. These are believers in and around Jerusalem, early church there, and they were being flooded with the need by the Judaizers to get back into going under the, the sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood system and everything, to get back to that. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, that word our knowledge is epinosis. The unsaved do not have epinosis of the truth because it requires to have a quickened human spirit before you can have epinosis. The unsaved don't get epinosis. They get gnosis, which is knowledge, but they don't get spiritual knowledge because 1 Corinthians 2, 12 says, that, and verse 14 says, they don't have the ability to discern spiritual things because they're sukikos. They're not they're not, they don't have the Spirit of God in them, and they don't have a, a live human spirit to ping to. So these are bel true believers. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge, the spiritual knowledge of the truth that is in our human spirit, which means we're saved, then there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Because Jesus' sacrifice for sins is it. 
the priest would go in daily and offer sacrifices for sins. And the writer, perhaps Paul, whoever it is, is saying right here, you go sin. It doesn't do you any good to kill a goat and a lamb or something and take it up there for the priest to offer up a sacrifice on your behalf because that's just spilt blood, wasted blood. Jesus is offered once for the sins of mankind. There's no more offering for sin, this book says. There's no more sacrifice. But he doesn't say you're losing your salvation. But certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation. Yeah, God's not happy about it. Which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law die without mercy under two or three witnesses. Oh, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongs to me, I'll recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, and afterwards you were illuminated. You endured a great fight of afflictions. You were even made a gazing stock. People made fun of you publicly by reproaches and afflictions, and while you became companions, companions of them that were so used. You even had compassion on me, my bonds. Took joy for the spoiling of your girl goods, knowing yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. So cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense or reward. He's talking to believers here. Cast not away therefore your confidence. That is in the blood of Christ and what he's done for his being complete. That has great recompense or reward for you. That's a motivational virtue toward God. It builds courage toward your circumstances. For you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God that you will receive the promise. For yet a little while, and that's rewards is the context here. For after a little while, and he shall come, will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any draw back, that is from the favor of God, my soul will have no pleasure in him. That's, you can be divinely court-martialed. That's loss of sal- that's not loss of salvation. That's loss of physical life. That can be the sin unto death. But he says, and I'm encouraged, verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We're them that believe to the saving of the soul. The context has to do with the believer who commits sin after salvation and attempts to get restoration with God through the Old Testament method of animal sacrifices. And please remember, so many of these passages that we have looked at were written at a time when new believers were at one time practicing Jews. They had to think differently in the new era of grace, which is the church age. Things were changing, and it was different and difficult to accept this new era. Very difficult to accept it. But they were challenged to do that. They were shown those temporary miracle gifts, healing gifts, faith gifts, tongue gifts, and these other things to help give them the little boost to help give sight to their faith to get them off the ground, as it were. We've got the entire Word of God now to go by, and that's what we need to stick with. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for your